Hey, and welcome to the February webinar of the NASA Night Sky Network. This month, we welcome Dean Regas to our webinar, who will take us on a whirlwind tour around the cosmos. Dean's been the, been the astronomer for the Cincinnati Observatory since 2000. He's a renowned educator, author, national popularizer of astronomy, and an expert in observational astronomy, and also uh, a former director of the Cincinnati Area Project Astro uh, Program, which is, uh, and so I had the privilege of working with Dean for several years, and that program was much more active. And uh, so that's been about 10 years ago that, uh, that we were working on it. So, and, and so it's been a great pleasure to be able to know Dean for that long. Dean is also the co-host of Stargazers, a new twist on an iconic backyard astronomy program which airs on over 100 PBS stations around the world. He's the author of several books, including the one that we're giving, giving away this evening. He's also a contributing editor to Sky and Telescope and Astronomy Magazine, so you probably have read something uh, by him in there. Then he won the 2008 Out of This World Award for Astronomy Education from Astronomy Magazine. He's done a lot of other writing, and if you listen to NPR, you may have heard him on Science Friday with Ira Flato. And this year, he also began an astronomy podcast with Anna Heyman, Heyman, Heyman called Looking Up. So please welcome Dean Regas. Well, good evening, everybody. Uh, thank you very much for having me here today. Everybody hear me okay? Uh, I'm coming to you uh, from the Cincinnati Observatory, and uh, so uh, we're not used to doing uh, these uh, webcasts here at night. Uh, and so we have a we have a pretty dark sky outside here, even though we're in the heart of the city. And uh, I just got done uh, teaching a class on the night sky, and of course, in typical February Cincinnati fashion, it is completely cloudy. So. Uh, the good news is I got to get out of class early. Uh, the bad news is we don't get to see any stars. But uh, I know you all know this uh, from quite a, a great experience. The bane of our existence is, is clouds. But, uh, well, today I'm uh, very excited to talk to you guys about uh, some uh, projects that, that, that I'm doing and uh, some uh, a little bit of a software program that maybe some of you know of that can take us uh, on a tour of the universe. And so I was going to demo this with you guys. Uh, this is a, a program that I use on a, a lot of my Tour of the Universe programs where I take people from the Earth off to the farthest reaches of outer space. And uh, But first, before I get to that, uh, just to give you a little background to uh, my place and where I am, I'm going to bring up the screen here and let's see if this will work. There we go. Uh, so this is the place uh, where I work. This is Cincinnati Observatory. And uh, definitely, you all have an open invitation to come visit anytime. We're a National Historic Landmark with some of the oldest telescopes in the world. Uh, we have our one main building and our secondary building. Uh-oh. Uh, that looks like, uh-oh. There it is. Our secondary building looks like that. And we have a very old telescope, one of the oldest telescopes in the world, made in 1845 made out of wood and brass, it's 16 feet long, 11 inches diameter, 11 inch refractor. This is the most gorgeous scientific instrument I've ever seen. I mean, the, the Harvard has the, uh, the newer one and the bigger one, but man, I, ours just looks pretty sweet. And we let people look through it. So this is uh, open to the public pretty much every single day that people can look and see the sun safely with the solar filter. And then at nighttime, uh, we let people look through this old telescope, just a gorgeous thing. And then we can show people the new telescope, the new one from 1904. It's a 16-inch Clark refractor. And uh, this is an amazing scope to, to look through as well. And so both scopes are in perfect working order, and we use them on such a regular basis. So anytime you're in the Cincinnati area, you stop on by, say, Dean sent me, and we'd love to show you around and show you the scopes. Uh, Something that Brian mentioned, in addition to my job at the observatory, uh, I'm also on the TV show called Stargazers, and this is uh, that show that used to be run by Jack Horkheimer, and it's uh, me and uh, James Alberry there on the left, and we fly through space on hoverboards and tell you what's up in the sky. Uh, so if you don't have this in your on your local PBS station, tell them to get it because it's free, and uh, we have one-minute shows and five-minute shows every every day. Uh, and every week we have different shows, but uh, they run pretty much daily. And so you can check it out. You can also see it on the internet. Now, I will dispel one myth, and this is very weird. When I started on the show, 
uh, I asked them if, if Jack ever got some weird questions. And the weirdest question was, somebody said, Jack, do you really go into space? And we're like, uh, I mean, the graphics are good, but I mean, they're not that good. I mean, come on. So this is what really happens. We're standing in front of a green screen in North Miami, Florida. And there's uh, me posing like Orion, the hunter. I, the, the likeness is uncanny, I'm sure. And then they put the background in behind us, so we have to pretend we're all in different locations. But anyway, we try to keep it pretty lighthearted and pretty fun with this. Uh, so check out Stargazer. You can find that on the internet, too, very easily. And then uh, I've uh, written a few books. Uh, my first book was called Facts from Space. It has uh, about 1,000 facts in it from all around the universe. And then uh, two years ago, I wrote a book called 100 Things to See in the Night Sky. This will uh, take you on a great tour of the sky through all the seasons. It's a great beginner's guide to find stars, constellations, planets, uh, my top things to see, top objects, top uh, events to look for. And then uh, the other book was, well, you know, if I made a Northern Hemisphere book, the publisher thought, oh, how tough could it be to write a Southern Hemisphere book? Why not do that? And uh, boy, that was, I was living in the Southern Hemisphere in my mind for quite a while, but it's a fun book to check out if you ever go uh, down to the Southern Hemisphere and farther south. And uh, the other thing that Brian mentioned is, uh, this is kind of new, well, last year or two, uh, I started a podcast called Looking Up, where we talk about astronomy topics and uh, popular astronomy things that are in the news. I have a co-host with uh, Anna Heeman. She's also an employee here at the observatory, and the, 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 the shtick for this thing is I'm the astronomer, and she is the down-to-earth person that can keep me grounded and, and uh, make sure that I tell everything uh, is, uh, more to the average person that they can palate. And so uh, it's a great little mix, the two of us together, um, that uh, kind of a fun thing. So check out that uh, wherever you find podcasts. So we have a new episode every two weeks. So without further ado, this is the, what I want to delve into is give you guys a tour of the universe. We're going to blast off of the earth, go out into space, make a few stops along the way, and then see the whole universe from very, very far away. And so I'm going to switch to another program here. Let's see if I can do that without any uh, big hassle. Oh, well, there's me back up there. All right, that's good. Let's see if I can bring up the program. Now, this is a program that we use... Uh, called Mitaka. It's spelled M-I-T-A-K-A. -A. And so the best way to find it is just do a Google search. Uh, and because it's, it's a very interesting uh, program. And so let's see, let me bring it up here. And so this is uh, the program that comes up, M-I-T-A-K-A. -A. And the, the thing with this is it works great on PCs. The, the Mac version, well, the Mac thing's not quite working. There's a Mataka Plus that kind of worked but didn't work great. But if you do have a PC, this is a really powerful program. How this program came about, I have no idea. It just appeared on the internet and somebody said, check this out, Dean. You got it. This is really cool because you can go anywhere in space. You can make it any time. You can click on something and go to that location. And it is so easy to use. Just think of it as like the powers of 10 that you can actually drive yourself. So I'm going to demo this for you. And this is kind of a, a similar program that I give uh, when I go out and do outreach programs, when I go to star parties, when I go to uh, any kind of thing for the public. That you'll, you'll kind of get an idea of how you can maybe use this for your own programs. And I'm sure some of you have already used it before. So I've got to switch to this thing called landing takeoff mode. And so we're in the, 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 I guess, the takeoff mode. And so all I do is click on this and I can leave the Earth behind. Here we go. As we blast off of the Earth and uh, we come above, above Japan, of course. It's a Japanese program. It should be coming above Japan. And so here we can see the entire Earth in one, one fell swoop. And we can look at different parts of the Earth. So you can click and drag and look at different parts of the earth. So here we're looking at Asia and Africa and Europe in daytime, come around here to nighttime. And so you can really demonstrate the, the, the difference between day and night. And so it's daytime when the sun is, when you're pointed towards the sun and nighttime when you're pointed away from the sun. Make a little eclipse there and there we go. And the other thing that you can do then is, so you can zoom in and out from any object, then you can also manipulate time. So we can move time forward and show the Earth rotating, and we can play Superman and go backwards if we want, but let's just keep going forward. 
And so here we are, we can show the Earth rotating once every day. We spin towards the day, like it's a spin towards the sun, it's daytime. And one of the other little pluses is if we go up here above the North Pole, we can demonstrate something about the seasons a little bit. We can see how, as I spin the Earth, a section of the, of the, the globe is not getting any sun. It's 24 hours of darkness up there above the North Pole. Whereas if we go to the Southern Hemisphere, the seasons are reversed and you get 24 hours of daylight. Well, not for long. Oh my gosh, it's almost March, isn't it? And so we'll be getting close to the equinox where we're gonna have 12 hours all over the place. Let's go back up to the North Pole here and we'll get you a little dizzy. And now we're gonna blast off of the Earth and go to the closest neighbor in space. And this is one of the pluses of this program is I usually tell people that I have a couple themes to my talk. And this uh, theme number one is space is really big. And so here, just to see the scale of the Earth moon distance, this is pretty startling to a lot of people, seeing how far away the moon is from the Earth. This is 240,000 miles. But uh, we can see the moon is a little speck there. And there's the Earth quite a distance away. And this surprises so many folks, they picture the moon would be a lot closer. But here we see the moon's orbit, its pathway around the Earth. And I can speed up our time here a little bit. We can watch the moon revolve around the Earth. So there we go. And we can go all the way through a whole cycle and get the moon back. And now we've shown a whole month. And so this is great to show the difference between rotation, the Earth spinning, and revolution, the moon revolving around the Earth. This also really shows how far humans went. We're coming up to the 50th anniversary of the moon landing, and this is what's such a great feat is it took three days to fly to the moon. They spent a few days on the moon, three days to fly back. But, it's, of course, it's gotta be rocket science. So you can't just fly at the moon, you have to fly where the moon's gonna be in three days. And that's what was so great about this feat. It was such an amazing uh, adventure to go all the way to the moon. All right, so that's stop number one. Stop number two, well, let's back it up some more. And now we can see at this scale, the moon's orbit is going to be almost nothing on this. It's going to disappear. And now we're going to start to see the orbit of the Earth. And we'll start to see a few other lines. I'll let you guess which orbit is that one. And then we got another one out here. And then we got another one in there. And so we back up a little bit more, and now we can see our pathway around the sun. I'm going to center on the sun now. So you double click on any object, and it'll center it up. And I can still go in three dimensions so we can see all around. And uh, let's pause right here for a little bit so we can see the inner solar system. We have Mercury, Venus, Earth, and Mars, and their orbits. We also have one extra little thing in here, one AU. This red circle is one astronomical unit the average distance from the Earth to the Sun. And so let's move our time forward a little bit faster. We're gonna go one day at a time and watch the planets circle the Sun. So here we go. And we see a few interesting things. We see all the planets are going around the Sun the same direction. They are not going the same speed though, and so it looks like who's fastest? Mercury. Second fastest, Venus. Third fastest, Earth. Fourth fastest, Mars. And so my old professors would say, Dean, that's a pattern. Certainly looks like it. The closer you are to the sun, the faster you go. Uh, now, one thing I've also learned is uh, I give this talk to, uh, to fifth graders a lot. So I do apologize in advance if I'm talking to you like a fifth grader at any point. It's just a force of habit, so I apologize. But one th thing I did learn from fifth graders that if you are ever talking to a fifth grader about planets, they love to hear about how old they are on other worlds. Because I say, okay, Let's say you're 11 on Earth. That means you've been around the sun 11 times. But if you lived on Mercury, you'd be like 45. And they're always like, oh, man, that's so old and all this stuff. And so it's a lot of fun. Then they want to know how old they'd be on Venus and how old they'd be on Mars. And so uh, if you ever want to entertain fourth, fifth, and sixth graders, that is a topic of conversation. I'll, I'll, let, you, I'll let you go with that. Uh, you can also see that the Earth is a little farther from the sun at different points. So we can see here we are in one astronomical unit. The Earth is a little bit farther from the sun in June. There's our date there. We go a little farther and we get to the farthest point is July. So this always kind of scares people. It's like, wait a second, why are we farther from the sun in July and then we're closer to the sun 
in January. This program demonstrates that pretty well and also shows you it's not that big of a difference from one to the other. And so if you get into your seasons talk, you can talk about how it's not the distance to the sun that causes the seasons, it's the tilt of the earth. Well, boy, we haven't gone very far. We got a long way to go here. So let's back it up here. Oh, one thing I'd always do like to point out to groups is to tell them Mars. You know, if we want to go to Mars, it's going to be a seven month journey. So that's about how long it takes to fly from Mars uh, to Earth to Mars. But when you get to Mars, there's a little problem. By the time you get there, Earth is going to be on the other side. And so that's why any manned mission to Mars, you've got to take your seven month journey to Mars and then it's one whole year on the planet. You have to wait for Earth to catch back up again. Then you climb into the spacecraft and you go seven months back to Earth. That's why Matt Damon ate all those potatoes in that movie. It's, this is one of those things you gotta really, this is why we haven't sent humans to, to Mars. It is a two, and a half, two to two and a half year journey to there and back versus going to the moon was only about eight days there and back. Well, let's back it up some more. Between Mars and Jupiter, we can see the asteroid belt and thousands and thousands of asteroids that are all circling around the sun also. And we've been looking at this from the top down. So if we look at it from the edge, we can see the solar system is pretty flat. This is the flat plane of our solar system right here. And most of the asteroids are in that plane also. Some you can see are kind of off to the edge. And you see that diagonal slash going through our plane with the label PLUTO. Oh man, that troublesome Pluto doesn't want to line up with all the other planets. And so there it is uh, crossing there. So uh, let's back it up here and we'll make a couple little other stops. Uh, we can stop at Jupiter for a quick little stop because, uh, well, we can zoom in on it and then see it's. I think at this point, 60 something moons, 67 moons. I don't think they have the new 12 one, 12 uh, moons on there, but we have the near the ones nearer the planet. And we can zoom in on the planet, see the stripes. We can move our time around and get the red spot back over here. There we go. And even moon shadows, you can simulate those with this. It's a pretty amazing program to, to, to set this for any date and time also. And we'll back it up again. And then we'll make another planetary stop at Saturn. And I'm doing this purely because it's my favorite planet. And it's pretty sweet to look at. Here's its 62 moons, and the inner moons, and the rings. So this is a pretty, pretty cool view to see these and you can simulate it all and zoom in and out. And you can also show the moons going around the planet too. And they follow that same rule. Closer ones go faster than the farther ones. One other thing I didn't do with Jupiter, but I can do with this is I back up here and we can see the outer moons they don't quite go in the plane of the, of the other moons. Look at them flying around. They're like little fireflies going all different directions. And so these small moons of Saturn are most likely captured out objects that uh, are still going around Saturn in all different directions and all different trajectories. It's kind of cool to see how they fly around. Okay, so we're gonna back up here some more. And let's back it up, uh, we'll center on the sun again. We're now at 10 astronomical units, 10 times farther away from the sun than the Earth is. And we get out to the outer planets, Uranus and Neptune. And then look at all this stuff out here. Oh my gosh, what a mess. Well, of course, when we were kids, this was a lot simpler. This, uh, this model would have been a piece of cake to memorize. We had all those nine things that went around the sun, Pluto being one of them. If I wanna show, them moving, I need to go one year at a time, and we'll advance our time one year at a time and watch the objects go around the sun at the very far distance. So here we can see Pluto, Haumea, Makimaki, Eris, and lots of other things. So yeah, when we were kids, this stuff wasn't out there. We didn't know about it. 
And our telescopes got better in the 90s and 2000s, and now we're up to well over a thousand objects that are going around the sun that we know about that are out here. I prefer the term plutoids myself, uh, rather than Kuiper belt objects and trans-Neptunian objects and all that stuff. I think Pluto, plutoids have a, has a nice ring to it. But you can definitely tell that the plutoids are not in the plane with the other planets. And they are mostly icy in nature. They have different origin than the planets, different uh, pathways, different orbits, different makeup, different sizes. So, sorry, there's no sympathy here for anybody that thinks Pluto is a planet. Pluto is whew, way different than all the eight planets. It is very similar to these other things out here. So I like calling Pluto a Plutoid myself, but I'll take your hate mail later, if uh, your, your arguments later. But uh, I do want to point out that when I was a kid, Pluto was my favorite planet because it was the oddball, because it was the weirdest one. It switched places with Neptune, it went way out, it went way in, it was the farthest, it was the smallest. But now it looks like Pluto is not weird, it has all these other cousins. And so Pluto is not as unique as maybe it once, once thought to be. And so there is a new Pluto, a new weird object named Sedna. And so Sedna, I don't think that's very new, is it? It's been known for quite a while. But here's its uh, orbit. It takes it almost 1,000 AUs out from the sun. To see it moving, I have to go 100 years at a time. And advanced time there, it's, so it's going to slowly when it's far away, fast when it's close. It takes about 12,000 years to go around the sun almost. And so if you like oddballs, Sedna is the new Pluto. I'm going to make up t-shirts that says that. Sedna is the new Pluto. I'm not as bad as Neil deGrasse Tyson that says, there, get over it. I, you know, I still I want to be positive. So Sedna is, is the one that we're looking at. And Sedna's weird orbit is maybe an indication that there's something else out here. Uh, what's been called Planet Nine could be out here among the Oort cloud. This is where the long period comets live that make really big orbits around the sun. Some of the orbits can even go all the way out to one light year, the distance light travels in a year. And a comet with an orbit out to here would be about one million years to go around the sun one time. So this is the whole solar system in this, in this big circle. And planet nine, if it exists, is somewhere in here. And uh, that's always fun. As an observational astronomer, I always uh, joke with the theoretical folks, you know, like, oh, yeah, on paper, it's going to be right there. And I have to always chuckle and say, well, doesn't count till you see it. So, uh, but anyway, any day now, hopefully Mike Brown and company are going to find planet nine and we can put it on the map. So... This is the solar system out here to about here. This is the, basically the gravitational reach of our sun. And our sun is the center of this. It's our one star in our solar system. And we'll zoom on in real fast here to check it out. So if we want to, if we want to go to the next level, we want to go to the next star. And I, I point this out because a lot of people get confused about uh, what's the solar system, what's the galaxy, what's, uh, you know, these different levels to this. And, uh, and so it's definitely really cool to point out that, you know, our solar system has one star, that's the sun. And everything else out here, all those other stars are their own solar systems. So let's back it up. We'll go back out to one light year again. And we're going to go to our nearest star system to the sun. And I call it a system because it's not a solitary star. There's Alpha Centauri, the system. It's a triple star system, two big yellow suns and one little red one that orbits around the other two. And it's always fascinating to, to, to share this imaginary view from the triple suns uh, with an audience. If anybody's familiar with any Star Wars movie or any kind of movie where there's multiple suns in the sky, you tell them about Alpha Centauri where you have two yellow suns and one little red one. And just their imaginations can go kind of pretty crazy with this. And uh, then I have to bring them down to Earth and remember my theme. Do you remember my theme? Space is really big. Well, travel time. If we wanted to fly to Alpha Centauri, uh, Proxima Centauri, the closer star, 
and it's only a mere 25 trillion miles, it would take you with the fastest spacecraft we've made, it'd take you still about 74,000 years to get there. And so whenever I tell that to the fifth graders, inevitably one of the fifth graders yells out, I'd be dead. I go, yeah, yep, yeah, you would be dead. That is correct. 74,000 years just to get there. Even if we sped things up a little bit, let's say we went 10 times faster, it's still going to take you forever to get there. And that's what I like about the stars in this way is they're this, they're, they're this, such vast distances. They're this untouchable thing, but we can study them from all the, even from back here on the earth. Well, let's go back out some more because that's only our closest star. And then we can back up here to see some stars like Sirius and Procyon. And out to 30 light years, we get to Fomalot, Altair, Vega, Pollux, Capella, Castor, out to 100 light years. And this is all in three dimensions. So this star is all around us. And now you're starting to feel, boy, we're getting a little small here in the scheme of things. You get out here to 1,000 light years where we get to Canopus, Spica, Polaris, Alberio, Betelgeuse, Rigel, out to Deneb, one of the farthest stars you can see with the naked eye. And now you're starting to feel, boy, this every one of those dots is a star. Every one of those is a, is a sun that somebody has seen in a telescope. And we back up some more. And then we find that all those stars are just one tiny part of one arm of the Milky Way galaxy. And man, that just jumps to a whole nother level to see our whole galaxy, 200 to 400 billion stars making this flat pinwheel shape. This is our galaxy that we live in. And we're not even in the center, we're out here towards the edge. We're like two thirds out to the center. And I always like this program because I was like, yeah, there's. 200 to 400 billion stars, and ours is that one. I'm glad they let me point it out pretty easily because I don't think I'd find it otherwise. Now, uh, this has been a big uh, jump to get out here to the Milky Way, and it's, you know, not only are we not the, the center of the universe or that the sun goes around the Earth or any of that, we're not even in the center of our galaxy. We're out here in the, on the, the edges. Now, I think that's probably a good thing is in the center of our galaxy. This is where most of the stars are jam-packed. So we can zoom in and see the center of the galaxy where it's gonna get very bright very fast. And as we get to the very heart of the galaxy, we get to explore something, an object that is very deep, dark, mysterious, massive. Anything that falls into it disappears and it warps space and time around it. That's our simulated view of the black hole in the center of the galaxy. And so this is the equivalent of four million suns all in one spot. The mass of four million suns and the gravity is so intense that, boy, it even warps the lines on the program. Man, that's intense. Now, and everybody always wants to know, well, what's, like, what's it like if you fall in? Well. Nobody knows, and I don't want to find out myself personally. And luckily, this black hole is so far away from us, nothing's ever gonna, we're not gonna fall into it. These stars that are nearby better watch out though, and we're watching them pretty carefully. So we're gonna leave the black hole behind and go out a little bit farther. So we're almost to the edge. Well, I guess maybe not. We really haven't gone very far. We've only gone now to a couple thousand Eh, maybe 100,000 light years. There's our 100,000 light years circle. And we can see a few other of our dwarf galaxies around us, the large Magellanic Cloud, the small Magellanic Cloud, some other dwarf galaxies that are nearby. And then we can back it up to see our next major galaxy. And I think everybody probably knows what that one is. There we go, up at the top about two and a half million light years away, the Andromeda galaxy. So that's the next big spiral galaxy out. And so there's the Andromeda galaxy when I zoom in with its satellite galaxies. And so we're looking at one trillion stars. And I try to imagine what is that like? What does one trillion stars look like? And it's, you know, because we see this in a telescope and it, boy, it doesn't look all that special. It looks like it's 
blobby gray thing. But when we get these you know, long exposure photographs, then we can see the spiral arms, we can see the structure. But what boggles my mind is that this is up there in the sky in the fall and the winter, it's up there in the sky, but as a city dweller, I don't get to see it. I never can see it with the naked eye. And that's what doesn't make any sense is how can one trillion stars not be visible in my night sky? That's how far away this galaxy is. It's hard to wrap your brain around distances, but when I explain one trillion stars is invisible, that's how far this, this galaxy is. Well, we got another galaxy just a little farther away. Just a hop over there is the Triangulum Galaxy, a mere 40 billion stars. Yeah, that's not even worth talking about too much, right? I mean, come on. We don't have time for little galaxies. And so we've got one more level. And yeah, we do have a little problem with Leo AAAA. I got to work on that. I think I need to work on the code on that one. But anyway, that's a galaxy. But at this level, we have one more jump to go. We're out at the galaxy level, and at this point, every dot in the background is not a star. Every dot is a galaxy of stars. Each one of these dots represents a galaxy that has been viewed through a telescope one way or the other. And so I'm going to back us up and show you how many galaxies that we have seen so far in our telescopes. Here we go. And that's the universe. Well, kind of. That's what the universe looks like from where we are. And that's only the universe that we've seen so far. We can kind of see the structure of the galaxies in here. It looks kind of like a butterfly shape. And this is based on two things. One is this is the plane of our galaxy. So all those billions and billions of stars are blocking our view. So we can't see this way and this way as well. The other problem with this is well, there's holes in our map. That's because they ran out of money. So we get the astronomers some more money. They fill in these holes. We figure out how to look through the galaxy, which we're getting pretty, uh, we're almost getting it down now. So these things, these holes are going to be filled in. And so if this is a representative sample of all the galaxies in the universe, we're looking at two trillion galaxies in our universe, each with billions and billions of stars in it. The farthest thing out here this is the farthest stuff that we can detect. This is the cosmic microwave background radiation. This is the leftover heat of the creation of the universe, the Big Bang. This is the farthest stuff that we can detect. Only a few degrees difference than absolute zero, but still amazing that we can see this all that way, 13 billion light years away. So that's all of it, everything in our universe. And so, boy, there's a lot of other questions you can get from this. Are, is this the only universe? Are there other universes just outside of ours? Are there multiple universes? Are there infinite number of universes? Well, sure, I'm open to anything, but uh, right now the, there's no evidence. We don't have any evidence that there are other universes out there. And could there be other universes? Sure. Might we ever detect them? Maybe. I don't know. I do have a, 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 a philosophy, unfortunately, that's a little bit contrary to most of the multiverse theory, because I have a definition of the universe that's maybe a little different than most folks. My definition of the universe is everything. All the stars, all the galaxies, everything that we can detect is in the universe. So, follow my train of logic here, if we detect another universe, it is not another universe because once we see it, it becomes our universe. Oh yeah. So uh, my, my web of logic uh, says there are no other universes, but uh, I understand that's pretty faulty logic, but anyway, I, I try. Well, at the edge of the universe here, uh, it's getting a little cold, so I think it's time to fly us back home. And since we are going to fly home here and uh, time is a little short, I'm going to target the Earth and I'm going to fly home very fast. And I do realize there is no sound in outer space, but I'm going to use sound effects. 
So hold on to your seats. And the moon, the moon. So we went all the way to the edge of the universe and back to the earth and I got you home. Oh boy, I got you home a little late at the bottom. It's July 1st, 29,762. Whoops. Oh boy, sorry about that. Your, your families have been worried sick about you. Uh, so, but my apologies. Well, so I, I think this is pretty crystal clear of uh, my theme of space is really big. I think this captures that so well that you can, it's so manipulatable that you can just go to different places and, and really dig into this. And the other thing that this uh, strikes me is, sure, it's gonna make your audience feel very tiny. That is true. But this is also what's so exciting about our field is that even though we're teeny tiny creatures living on this little planet circling around a mediocre star and a average galaxy in a cold dark universe, we're unbelievably smart, teeny tiny creatures. Look at what we've done from this little planet, this little observatory called Earth, and we can use our, we are crafty creatures. We can use our instruments to find all these things out in space, to study the sizes and temperatures and makeups of stars, to find planets around other stars, to see galaxies 13 billion light years away. So for teeny tiny creatures, I'm super excited to be in the forefront of, uh, of this best of all the sciences of astronomy because every day we get to add to this map. Every day we find a new asteroid, we put it on the map. We just found a whole fleet of stars, we're gonna put that on the map and galaxies and this is our, our uh, journey through the universe. And so this is a, a, a really powerful program and um, it is super easy to use. All you have is those buttons in the bottom left that zoom in and out, bottom, bottom, uh, buttons on the up top, upper right that you can change your time forward and backwards. It is so easy to use. So I hope you guys try it out. And uh, you know, if, if you have an audience, this is a cool thing to do. And if you ever uh, need me to come and visit, I'd be happy to do that too and uh, give you guys a little talk about this. Uh, because this is one of my favorite programs to do and the reaction you get from audiences is just so powerful that they're they're just like blown away. Um, so it's just a great, uh, great program to use and uh, thank you so much for uh, letting me share it with you. And I'd be happy to take uh, some questions if folks have them or any comments. Okay. Well, that's fantastic, Dean. That's a really powerful piece of software. And so we do have a few questions here. Excellent. Um, we have a couple of people and we're probably going to, it'll probably have to be an interactive one and you'll probably have to go back to it. Uh, several people are wondering um, if you could show us where approximately the Voyagers are. Um, sure. So where are the Voyagers? That's a good question. Okay. So let me go back here. We'll share. We'll do that. We'll do this. Okay, where are the Voyagers? Okay, well, it is the year 29,000, but still, at the, the, we will ignore that part. Uh, so let's go out here. The Voyagers are uh, out, I believe they're over 100 AUs out now. Uh, my vague memory is one of them is at 130 or something like that, but I might be off by a little bit. If nothing else, they're somewhere around this, this region. And so you think they left 40 years ago and they are out this far, which is incredible to be out this far. But in the scheme of things, I, I always like those, uh, those um, news stories. Every so often uh, the media picks up on that the Voyagers have left the solar system and you know, they've hit this new region of the solar system. And I always laugh about that because, you know, they got a long way to go to leave the solar system in my mind. They got to get out to here where the comets are and get past the comets. And they've got about uh, tens of thousands of years till they're going to get out there. But uh, yeah, so in the scheme of things, the Voyagers are pretty darn close. And we did have the um, uh, New Horizons spacecraft fly past Pluto. That was a nine and a half year journey to get to Pluto and then redirected to the other object, the uh, uh, one I think it's called Ultima Thule is now they're calling it the one that uh, looks like a double object. That's not too much farther out here, but uh, yeah, that's that's out where the Voyagers are. 
All right. And so, uh, so how far are, are Pioneer? They're not quite as far as the Voyagers. And so where would they be located in? Yeah, still similar similar di distances. They were slower spacecraft, so the uh, the Voyagers, I think, I can't remember if it's one or two that's out farther than the other. Um, I can never remember because uh, I think it was two that they redirected to the other planets, and one just kept on zooming out there. Uh, but I can never, I can't keep them all straight, but they're all still in that, uh, that 100 to 150 AU range, uh, so still relatively close after 40 some years, but I do believe the Voyagers have passed. They're farther out than the Pioneers. I believe that's correct. Yes, I, I, I think that that's correct. And, you know, mainly because the Pioneers were going quite a bit slower. Yes, yes, that is correct, yep. Okay, so uh, early on, and, and this is would be kind of a, a, so a lot of the material, did you program some of the material into this or was this all, um, on board the uh, the program that you did all the all the circles and all the, the distance. It is all pre-programmed. I have no experience whatsoever in doing any of that, so I wouldn't even know the first place to even start. That's what's so uh, so great. This was all pre-made by somebody for some mysterious reason, but it, 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 everything that I've done with it seems as accurate as possible. The way that the, the planets go around the sun has been improved and, and made more accurate. The way that uh, the positions of the stars, the position of the galaxies, everything I've tested has been, it's been spot on. So the uh, kudos to the Mataka team, whoever they are, wherever they are. It's one of those, uh, when, it, when it first came out, the instructions were only in Japanese. And I had to like go through it as, as well as I could just on my own. But it's, uh, now they have an English version and uh, they have other different uh, versions, uh, newer new updates they put onto it. And so this one that I was using might not be the newest of the updates, but it also can be uh, altered. You can enter some things. So I think we had one of our uh, interns that he put in a, 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 an asteroid that he wanted to highlight. And uh, he also figured out how you could start from wherever you're from. from. So if you want to start from Cincinnati, you could zoom off from Cincinnati. So it is something you can alter the programming for yourself, too. Okay. That's good. I know early on, uh, Ron had noted uh, what uh, was wondering about what plane was used for the one year light circle. But then I think as we backed out, that it became much more evident uh, what it was. And so somebody, you know, actually put something in that was useful and all right different landmarks it seems so. exactly exactly yeah they wanted to have the you know the plane of the solar system and the plane of the galaxy and uh so yeah they have and to show how they they crisscross and and that's really kind of cool stephanie asked a question she says does this uh, have the capability of showing the constellations from the different areas of the solar system in the universe could you put up the constellation lines and then move around to see what the relative distances are to the stars in the constellation. That's a real good question. So when they, uh, they, they issued another one called Mataka Plus that was out for a while, and that one you could do that with. This one I wasn't so sure, because uh, I haven't done it lately, so let me double check. Uh, we'll just go here and have a little fun. Um, yeah, Mataka Plus could do it really well. This one, I don't know if it ever did. Uh, let's see if we can put in the constellations. I don't think they will let you do it, unfortunately. So you could go to some some specific places. They'll let you go to the Pleiades star cluster. That's kind of neat. Castor's the six star system, uh, and then you can go to uh, there's the black hole. You go to the M13, uh, and then uh, Virgo cluster, Andromeda galaxy spacecraft. So oh, well, here we go. Boy, that would have been easier if I would have known that ahead of time. Go to Voyager, so I don't know where it is. Oh, I guess there it is. Okay, there's 100. I, boy, if I zoom in, what's going to happen? Oh, man, I got to zoom in a lot. I'm rolling, I'm rolling. Getting closer, getting closer. Boy, I don't know. I don't see a spacecraft. Is anything getting bigger? Oh, oh my gosh, there it is. It would have been nice for them to have had the, uh, the tag on it uh, 
so that you have some confidence that you're actually going towards it. I know, that's right, yeah. So, because if I back up the scale here to, uh, whoop, there it goes, goodbye. Yeah, so I don't think this one has that capability to do um, the constellations. Uh, but yeah, you can try Mataka Plus that, uh, oh, wait a second, what's this? Oh my goodness. Here I am supposed to be the expert on this. Although I don't see any lines. Hmm. Well, there's always stuff to, to mess around with. Illustrations, whoops. Oh, there we go. There's some lines. You're still too far in the depths of the solar system. I think so. So there's Alpha Centauri and something. Oh, there we go. I'm already messing up something. Yeah, so you can do it a little bit, but uh, let's see if we go back to, uh, let's go back to the Earth here and we'll scale it back in. There we go. Let me even scale a little closer. Yeah, so there's the constellations out there and we can see there's the Southern Cross, for instance. So if you leave the Earth, I wonder, yeah, how, how distorted it ends up getting. I mean, you have to go pretty far to actually see it change significantly. Yeah, I guess you lose some lines in there. But uh, you get at least a few constellations, but not the whole thing. Oh, there's Orion gets all messed up. That's cool. Yep. It looks like it starts to give a, at least a little bit of a sense of... Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, that those stars aren't all equal distant. Exactly, yeah. And that's one of the things is I, you know, there's always more with this program that I'm still finding. Uh, again, because of the lack of instructions, you just have to play around with it until you find this stuff. Well, that's the best way. You just keep pushing buttons until it does what you think it should do. <laughs> exactly, exactly. <laughs> But I do apologize for folks watching. It's never fun to watch somebody try to figure out a program. I do apologize for that. That's like- I look we're all looking over your shoulder. It's over there, it's over there. No, it's over there, no, no, <laughs> it's not there. <laughs> okay, well, Lewis asks, uh, he's got a, you know, it's kind of a comment, but it's a question or two. He's always told there's no such thing as the center of the universe because the entire universe sprang from the Big Bang, but that doesn't make sense to me. And it's been determined that every galaxy is accelerating away from all other galaxies. So if each accelerating object has a direction, can you backtrace the directions in time to where they all converge? And kind of with the way that you demonstrated this, it, it, it made it appear that there was a center to everything. So maybe you know, how oh, yeah. can you utilize this to... Well, yeah, you, you caught me on something here. And the, the, what you caught me on was the, all everything I just showed you was a total illusion. All that that I showed you is what the universe looks like from our position. And that's the, the, the whole thing is that it appears that we're in the center. Uh, and there's two ways to look at this. Is one, is, is the universe infinite? And if it is infinite, that it goes on in all directions forever, then you are in the center. By definition, wherever you are, if I move two feet to the left, I'm still in the center. You as the observer are the center of the universe. If it is not infinite, which uh, there's a lot of debate about that, if it is, a, then this is all just appearance that it looks like we're in the center, but that, that it's really not that way. It's just how we are from the observer, from uh, as us as observers. This is, uh, these are questions that are so deep and I would say, if anybody out there actually knows the answer, how do you imagine everything? This is, this is our, our, our feeble attempt at trying to uh, see what the view would look like if you were standing up looking at the whole universe. And so this is, this is a, a, a very effective map, but is it actually reality? That's the tricky thing because, well, all these things we're looking at in the distance are also things in the past. So when we're looking farther away, we're also looking at things that are older and, and not actually happening. Uh, so this is getting into some super deep questions. And these are also some answers that, boy, we don't know. It's one of those things is how do you imagine infinity? And, uh, I sure can't answer that myself. This is this is my best guess. Well, it's kind of back to that. Uh, you know, we 
obviously we have a preferred frame of reference because it's ours. So it's, <laughs> but then again, somebody uh, across the universe, uh, they're going to look up and think that they're the middle and that they have the preferred frame of reference. Well, and, and maybe we're all the middle. Everybody's the middle. That's the, the you know, when, uh, when your, your parents told you the earth doesn't revolve around you, yeah, you tell them, yeah, but I am the center of the universe. <laughs> There was a t-shirt once upon a time that, that said, uh, you know, center of the universe that's pointing to you. So. Yeah, that's right. That's right. Exactly. Okay, well, well, Jerry, you know, kind of in that same, you know, being here, I guess Jeremiah asks, uh, how far will the James Webb Space Telescope see past the Hubble? Using this program, will, will this enable us to be able to see past the cosmic background? Yeah, that is a tough prospect, seeing past the cosmic background. That is... Uh, in my mind, it, with our current technology, impossible. That's, that's, uh, it, so the idea of seeing past that, it, it's like this wall that, that we can't see past. And there, the reason for that is, well, when we're looking in space, we're also looking back in time. So when we are, see the, a sunset, that's actually the sun takes eight minutes for its light to get it to us. So the sun had already set eight minutes ago. You're just now getting the information. And when you look at stars, that's where they were years ago. So they're not really in that spot. When we look at those galaxies, those galaxies that are the youngest galaxies that are 13 billion light years away, those are also 13 billion years old. That is not where they are anymore. They just look like that. And we can't look past the cosmic background radiation because if we go back any farther, that's before time existed. Oh, that's deep, man. Yeah, because so you, so if we could see past that, then we would see before the universe. And we don't know what was before the universe. Was there anything before the universe? Uh, those are things that, uh, from what I can tell, I don't think that, I don't want to go out on a limb and say, we'll never figure that out, but it's going to be tough. So West South, uh, so with all the objects we see in the sky at night, what are the percentages of those being planet stars, galaxies, man-made satellites, et cetera, just rough numbers maybe. And, and so I suppose it depends on whether we're using a, a, an instrument of some sort or our eyes. Yeah, so with the naked eye, chances are what you're seeing are stars. And you know, with on a, on a really clear, dark sky, you can see thousands of stars. In an urban location, if you're in a city, you might see a couple dozen to a hundred stars. And pretty much every one of those is going to be a, 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 an actual star. There are five planets you can see with the naked eye. We've got Mercury, Venus, Jupiter, uh, Mars, and Saturn. Those are the five planets you can see without a telescope. And right now, Jupiter is in the morning. I hope everybody got up early this morning to see the Jupiter-Moon conjunction. If you saw a little star, a bright star next to the moon, it was actually Jupiter. And then we have another moon-planet conjunction on Saturday morning where the moon is going to be next to Venus. So outside of those five planets, everything else up there you're seeing is, is pretty much a star. Uh, of course, then you have satellites that it might be flying overhead as well. The International Space Station is by far the brightest and easiest to see. But then you also have, uh, well, I shouldn't say brightest, there's iridium flares, iridium satellites can really brighten up very fast and then fade away. Uh, so uh, there's a lot of apps that you can use to follow satellites. or Satellite Tracker, there's one called the, uh, uh, a Sputnik that I use to follow when satellites are going overhead. But pretty much every one of those are stars up there that you see. And uh, one of the facts that, that really blows people's minds is that you show all those stars up there. Every single one of them is bigger than our sun. Every one that you can see with the naked eye. There's one exception, a teeny tiny star in uh, the constellation of Eridanus that is just a smidgen smaller than our sun, but uh, good luck finding that one. All the other things are way bigger than our sun. In fact, most of those stars up there are like these behemoths like Betelgeuse and Rigel that are abnormal stars that we're seeing at night and uh, from these tremendous distances. All right, well, we're right at the top of the hour. I wanna do one more question and then we wanna, you know, your 
on Eastern time, and so it uh, might be getting close to your bedtime, although you are uh, an astronomer. And so I'm an astronomer. I, this is nothing. I'm just getting started. I'm just getting started. I got my coffee here. I'm ready to go. Uh, Actually, it's not coffee. It's chamomile. I'm going to sleep. Uh, Sorry. <laughs> so we're going to go one more question. And, uh, and, and so and this is another one, you know, kind of, I think this will expand some people's minds for that. So Virginia asks, what would happen to the universe without gravity? What would happen to the universe without gravity? Whoa, man, that's a tough one to picture. What would the universe be like without gravity? Well, um, hmm, I think uh, I would be floating away as we speak, uh, and so would everybody. Uh, let me think. So what forces would, be, would take over? If we had some forces that would take over, that would, uh, that would mess up everything i mean we wouldn't have anything on earth there probably wouldn't be an earth there wouldn't be a, a sun this is it's the, the forces of gravity that have brought things together to form into things um so if uh, let's say gravity disappeared on earth not only would you fly off of the earth all pieces of the earth would just go off into space if you would go uh, uh if you would start to uh, walking one way that's it you would just keep going that way there'd be no friction that you'd have uh, to slow you down uh that's boy that's like one of the most frightening things that i could think of uh is gravity suddenly turning off uh, because it, yeah it doesn't just affect you it affects every single thing out there uh, and it was uh, one of those uh Things that you know, we think of the the sun and the gas giant planets that they're all made of gases, and a lot of people say, "Well, how do they stay together if they're just gases? Aren't they just floating away like gases on Earth?" But you know, gases have masses also, and so those the gra they have a gravitational force, and so Jupiter is a ball of gases that's held together by the gravity of those gases, and same with the sun. So if we had no gravity, there would be nothing. You know, nothing would it would be a uh, chaos. Everything would be floating everywhere and um, we wouldn't be having this nice conversation either. Ah. <laughs> I know that would be kind of a, you know, if you think about them, you, know, you have to stop and think about these things. And so, you know, the weak and strong nuclear forces wouldn't do anything. Electromagnetic force, now you get all the molecules, but then on the outside, they'd be repelling to some extent because of the electrons. And, so, you know, it would get very, very complicated. And so, you know, I know, and, and you know, gravity is one of those uh, tough forces. It, uh, you know, it's always there. And uh, uh, I'm, I'm a, you know, I always think of, uh, if anybody's a big fan of the, the cartoon, The Tick, uh, whenever The Tick falls places, he's always like, gravity is a harsh mistress. I always think of that, and that's true. Gravity is will win out in the end. That's what happens. Uh, you will always uh, gravity will always uh, will always get you. Yeah. Well, that's a good place to end. And so, thank you very much, Dean. This has been absolutely fantastic having you here. Thank you for sharing the tour with the uh, with the new software that uh, I haven't seen before. Um, that's a really powerful piece. I love the graphics on it. It's uh, it seems like it's much easier to use than some of the other uh, classics like Starry Night or Stellarium and things like that. Yeah, most definitely. And I'll, I'll, uh, I'll send you guys a link to it, but really all you have to do is do a Google search for Mitaka, M-I-T-A-K-A, -A, and uh, you can follow that on there too. And, uh, uh, and be sure to uh, check out the uh, Stargazers uh, page too, so you can watch the Stargazer show. And uh, anytime anybody's in Cincinnati, drop by the observatory. We'd love to have you. All right. I know a few people, uh, we, we found David and I found the link and we posted it and a few people actually downloaded it and discovered that there were some potential security issues with their um, antivirus program. Really? Oh, it's it. Uh, yeah, because I, I know I had a problem with Stellarium once that I got uh, something that downloaded with it uh, and uh, they, they got that all figured out. But yeah, Mataka usually goes pretty smooth. Uh, if nothing else, I also, you can just get it, uh, I, I have it on a, uh, on a, uh, on a Dropbox and you can, you can like put it on a thumb drive and take it from place to place too. So it's uh, easy to do.
in this case, it was um, they don't have uh, SSL enabled on their web server. So some, if you're downloading a zip file or something from something oh. like that, some antivirus software will be like, oh, no, 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 no. Right, right. It's It'll, fine. Yep, um, yep. Yeah. <laughs> Been having a lot of SSL fun lately. We had an issue with the Night Sky Network's uh, moon feed uh, from the U.S. Naval Observatory because they had changed their SSL certificate. And they had some oh. Wow. Clear sky, the clear sky charts across the country were also affected by that, but they've not. Oh, okay. Wow. <laughs> well, hang on for a minute. We're gonna, I'm going to end this, and then we're going to come back for the wrap on. So that's all for tonight, everyone. You can find this webinar along with many others on the Night Sky Network website in the Outreach Resources section. Each webinar's page also features additional resources and activities. We'll also post tonight's presentation on the Night Sky Network YouTube channel in the next few days. Thanks and good night, everyone.